The story begins with a shovel digging into the earth. Someone lies there, getting covered by dirt. Soon, we see the main character, Pete, pumping his truck at a gas station. His son, Tyler, sits in the passenger seat, looking through a book. At the gas station store, Peter buys several magazines. While he is doing it, he looks at the like he wants it. Once he returns to Tyler with the magazines, the boy forms a smile. Pete starts to drive, and the music that plays indicates an easygoing time. However, it doesn't look like it, because Tyler looks at a photo of his family that includes his mother. In real life, it's just him with his dad. Upon arriving at their destination, we see they have a mean barking dog in the back of the truck. Pete asks the animal what is wrong. Alas, the dog hurt itself by jumping out. It was held by a chain, which has caused a serious injury. In an office, Pete signs a document that states he knows a demise occurred on this property before he purchases it. We learn he got a home with a storage facility. Afterward, he enters his new home with Tyler, and the boy wonders why the previous owners left all their belongings there. Pete doesn't know. Later, he buries their dog, which sadly lost its life during the accident earlier. His son asks if their pet is now in heaven with his mom. Pete does not have to guess. He says he knows the dog is there. He adds that at least they still have each other. In the next scene, he tells Tyler that the boy might not understand what his dad is doing, but one day he will. He says this place gives him a chance to do what he always promised his wife he would. It is to be home with Tyler more often. Tyler says he misses her, and his father tells him the same. At night, Pete takes down the photos of the previous family. He looks at one of them for some time. At a different time, he calls someone, saying he is calling from Plaza Mini Storage. The person he is calling about is named Mr. Wheelman. Pete says there is a unit that is behind on its payment by more than 60 days. The man on the phone tells Pete that Wheelman has moved and his new location is unknown. Then Pete calls a woman, who tells him she is Wheelman's wife. He asks to speak to her husband, yet she informs him he has early onset Alzheimer's. Not being able to resolve this matter brings stress to Pete. Following this, he goes to a storage unit with Tyler, who asks him what happened. He asks because the storage is covered with police tape. Pete cannot answer his son. At home, Tyler opens a box of items. He takes out a framed photo of his mother and wishes she were there. In the meantime, Pete approaches a storage unit with bolt cutters to break the lock on it. He hangs his own lock in the old one's place before he opens the unit. A cabinet resides there that he opens. Interestingly, it has several jars containing snakes in a liquid. Opening a box, he sees it has the same bottle he was looking at in the gas station store. He tries to walk away without taking it but can't bring himself to close the door completely. Thus, he reopens it to set his eyes back on the bottle. At home, Tyler hears something, prompting him to walk toward the sound. He sees a few small items on the floor. As he picks one of them up, he sees a red ball lying on the floor where he stood earlier. At night, Tyler takes out the trash and hears a metallic sound, so he starts to walk to where he heard it. At home, Pete looks at a drawing of possibly the previous family on the wall. The family's child must have drawn it. Tyler comes to the tape-covered storage unit. Since it's not completely closed, he gets on the ground to peek inside. Pete looks at a photo of the other family's son on a bicycle. When Tyler opens the unit, he sees the same bicycle in there. The next day, Pete calls someone about another storage unit. He says it is about eight months past its pay date. He wants to know who he has to speak to about it. The woman on the phone tells him the regular clerk will be back tomorrow. It seems like Pete keeps running out of luck with the unit. He goes to the storage area and sees his son riding the bicycle he found. Pete says he cannot keep it because it belongs to someone else. However, the boy wants it a lot. His desire forces Pete to allow him to keep it, on the condition that if someone looks for the bike, Tyler should give it back instantly. Soon we watch him ride the bike around the area. While Pete is on the phone, Tyler suddenly places himself against the window for his dad to see him. The boy calls to him like something is urgent. In a short time, they stand near a unit and Tyler says it is the one. Listening to what is inside, Pete claims it is just the wind, but Tyler says something was in there. Pete thinks this is a joke. He tells his son he is busy with work. Once Pete leaves, Tyler puts his ear against the unit. A sudden movement from the inside scares him, causing him to run away. Afterward, Pete calls a woman, asking her for the forwarding address of the previous owner so he can send the man his belongings. The woman tells him there is no family. They all lost their lives. When the conversation concludes, Pete looks at the security camera of the unit that is covered in police tape. He decides to go there with a flashlight and aggressively removes the tape to open the unit. All it has is a cabinet. He looks up to see a key hanging. The next scene shows Pete driving to a church with Tyler. 
The boy wants to stay in the truck for an unknown reason. Upon entering the church, Pete is greeted by a priest. He is Father Man, telling him they could always use new people to invest in their future. Pete's visit is regarding a storage unit rented by the church. It is past its pay date. Man says he does not know what is in there. Pete leaves the church and the priest looks at him curiously from behind the door. At home, Tyler asks his dad if they can hang up photos of his mom. Though Pete agrees to it, he says not tonight. He wants to get organized first. During his sleep, Tyler dreams about being in the storage facility alone. The dream comes with many unpleasant images. Pete thinks he's heard something from his son's room and goes to check on him. Walking in there, he steps on one of the small items Tyler found earlier. He looks under the bed to see many of them, along with the red ball. We see Tyler is lying awake, but his father doesn't notice. The next day, Pete finds Tyler standing barefoot near their dog's grave. Pete tries to talk to him, only to get no response. He promises Tyler they will get a new dog once they get settled. Later, Pete talks to someone on the phone, saying his son has been behaving somewhat oddly. This segues into Tyler occupying a therapist's office. She is Dr. Young. He tells her his dad said he had to be there. He also says his returning there depends on whether he likes her or not. Young asks him with a smile if he likes her. Tyler shrugs without looking at the woman. Since he claims he is just with his father, she asks where his mom is. He replies she went to heaven. She perished in a car accident. He gets asked how he feels, knowing she is not coming back to him. Tyler feels alone. He was scared to see his dad cry after the accident. Tyler's grandfather was yelling at his dad. It had something to do with whiskey. We learn that Pete was driving when the accident happened. In the meantime, Pete is looking at photos of his deceased wife in another room. Tyler tells Young the storage his father bought was a deal of a lifetime. Yet Tyler does not like the place. She asks if there has been anything different about his dad and Tyler gives her a sinister look. In a scary voice, he asks if she means he has gone mad like Jack's mom. Young gets taken aback hearing that. Oddly, Tyler says he didn't say anything, which gets him the reply that he mentioned Jack. She is curious to know how he knows about him, but the boy simply looks at her. Then Pete talks to the therapist alone. She says Tyler informed her about the accident with his mother. She also learned he was sent to live with a foster family. Pete says Tyler is back home with him now and he won't be leaving again. Young says Tyler's mother recently passed away and he was sent to live with strangers. She thinks he has suppressed the emotional trauma of those events. She would like to see the boy two or three times a week. Once they return home, man is there waiting for them. Thus Pete takes him to the church's unit. He breaks the lock with bolt cutters before leaving the priest alone to open the storage. Switching to Tyler in his room, he opens a box containing his personal belongings. He looks at several photos, especially of his mother. After man has collected all the things from the unit, he sees that small metal item Tyler found in the house. Man picks it up to look at it. He heads over to Pete and asks him if there is another unit the church has occupied. Pete tells him the only unit is the one Pete brought him to. On the next day, Tyler walks near the units until he stops at the one that had police tape covering it. He opens it to close himself in there. In one of the cabinet's drawers lies a key and a Bible. The key is to unit number 105, so he goes to that unit to open its lock. We don't get to see what lies inside when he enters it. Soon Pete looks for Tyler, but struggles to find him. He eventually finds the boy sitting in his office. Tyler sits at a distance, with his back toward his father. He asks why an unspecified, she, is present. Pete asks who he means, a question Tyler doesn't answer. Pete steps outside and sees Dr. Young has arrived. She apologizes for coming unannounced. Pete invites her into his office, where she asks how much he knows about the previous owner. Pete knows the man lost his life. He thinks he did it due to his family perishing. Young gives him the shocking news that the owner's wife took the life prior to her own. She tells Pete this because she was treating the son. She shows him a photo of Jack, the boy. His condition started with night horrors, and with Jack, knowing things he could not possibly have known. Even more strange, is that he would not retain the knowledge of those things. Jack also spoke in foreign tongues in addition to having voice alterations. Young says he became violent, yet Pete tells her his son would not hurt a fly. The same was said about Jack, replies the therapist. Regardless, Pete thinks Tyler cannot be compared to Jack. She says Pete knows something is wrong with Tyler. Therefore, she proposes to go to a certain hospital together to get Tyler the help he needs. Pete firmly tells her his son recently lost his mother and needs to learn to deal with the grief. Since Young keeps trying to convince him, he opens the door for her to leave. She wants to help his son before it is too late. She leaves the documents about the previous family for Pete to look through. At night, he takes out that bottle of 
he seems to have collected. As he drinks some of it, he looks like he knows he should not be. Then he peeks into Tyler's room to see the boy sitting on the floor. He is putting the metal items around the red ball. Pete draws near to speak to his son. But Tyler does not say anything. His silence prompts the man to ask why he isn't answering. In a distorted voice, Tyler says he can smell the on him. He asks if Amy smelled it too prior to Pete getting in the car. Taken aback by such talk, Pete asks him what did he say. He has to leave to express his anger outside. He also drinks more. Later, Tyler is having a nightmare again. We get a brief image of the car accident. Following this, Pete enters the unit we saw Tyler enter without seeing what is in there. This time, we see a table is there with a cassette player. Pete puts on the headphones and plays the device. A man named Father Williams talks with a boy he calls Michael Gibbons. The latter says he is nervous. Pete keeps changing the tapes to find something more interesting. On a certain tape, it sounds like Williams is performing an on Michael. The priest asks who he is speaking to now and a distorted voice tells him he must know. At this moment, Pete has to remove the headphones because he hears something outside the unit. The next scene shows us he fell asleep with the headphones on in his home. Our attention is slowly brought to Tyler sitting eerily on his bed. In the morning, Tyler asks his dad if something is wrong with him. Pete tells his son that he had more put on him in the last year than what most adults can handle. It's the rest of the world that is messed up, he adds. Afterward, Pete sees the gate being open on the security camera. He watches the recording to see Tyler opening the gate to wheel in a shovel. From another camera, he sees the disturbing sight of Tyler digging up their deceased dog. He took it out to wheel it to unit number 105. Thus, the next thing we see is Pete opening that unit to see the dog in there. He vomits and has to cover his nose. On the table there, he sees Tyler must have set up a memorial for his mom. Then he barges into Tyler's room to rudely ask the boy what is going on. He demands to know why Tyler dug out their dog. But Tyler says he didn't do it. Furious, Pete grabs him and demands to be told the truth. This brings his son to tears, making him run away. Pete cries too as a result. In a short time, he calls Young, sounding desperate. He tells her he doesn't know what to do. She asks if Tyler has any recollection of what he did to the dog. Pete says had he not seen it on video, he would have believed what Tyler told him. Soon Pete tells his son that the boy did not dig up the grave and Pete was wrong to react the way he did. Later, Young is at their home, asking Tyler if his dad has been drinking. Tyler says he has. He also says he feels scared when his father drinks. He is scared the man is going to perish. Young asks if Tyler ever hears voices that tell him to do bad things. Since he does not answer, she asks if he talks to anyone other than his dad. He talks to his mom, he replies. In the meantime, we see Pete in unit number 105, looking at the memorial Tyler has organized. He looks at a photo of his wife and says he misses her very much. He needs her now. Looking through the Bible, he reads a saved passage where God says he will put enmity between man and woman. He will put enmity between man's offspring as well as hers. Switching back to Young, she calls Tyler by his name, but he does not respond. Calling him the name Jack gets him to slowly turn his head to her. In the scary voice, he asks if she knows why Jack's mother took her. It was to save him. Tyler says Pete would not do that because he is too weak. Young tells him he usually refers to the man as his dad. Tyler asks if the doctor thinks Jack called his mom mommy when he was begging for Then Pete meets with Young, and she tells him Tyler has changed. She says he has the look in his eye that Jack had, being difficult. Pete insists his son is not Jack. Yet she reminds him that Tyler mutilated their deceased dog. She hands him a brochure of the hospital she mentioned earlier. He tosses it on the ground. Pete complains that he called her for help. However, she wants to send his son away. Young wants the stubborn man to understand that Tyler needs help urgently before he hurts himself or someone else. Angered, Pete replies he is not sending his son away again. He returns home to hug Tyler, saying the latter is not going anywhere. With a sinister face, Tyler says he loves him. While they lie in bed together, Pete takes out a tape from his pocket. It has the name, Michael Gibbons written on it. On the next day, Pete takes out a file that has a photo of a boy with his dad. The boy is on the bike Tyler found. Following this, he calls a woman to ask about Richard Gibbons, Michael's father. Pete wants to know how the man perished. She informs him Richard took his wife's prior to taking He did this in response to their son going missing. This information shocks Pete. Moving along, he listens to the tape about Michael. On it, Williams tells the boy he needs to fight, but Michael tells the priest that Michael is not there in a distorted voice. This prompts Williams to tell the demon that Michael does not belong to him. The boy's soul belongs to God, 
Williams commands the demon to state his name, which the demon does. His name is Ball. Pete listens to how Williams tries to perform an act. Soon man enters the unit. Williams asks for his help and man yells for Williams to stop. Man says there is no demon. Pete is forced to hear chaos take place. Having had enough, he removes the headphones. He calls the church to say he wants to speak to man. Alas, the priest is currently unavailable. Thus Pete demands that the lady on the phone call man to call Pete back. He wants her to tell him the former knows about Michael. Then Dr. Young gets phoned by Tyler. He tells her he wants to go to the hospital to get help. Once she asks where his father is, he says the man has been drinking. In the next scene, man calls Pete to ask how Pete knows about Michael. Not answering him, Pete says he's going to call the police on the priest. This causes man to say Michael was a danger to himself and his family. Man claims they have done everything they could. He adds he will be at Pete's home by morning. Responding to Tyler's call for help, Young arrives on the property. She calls out to the boy as she walks outside in the dark alone. It doesn't take long for her to see someone's shadow riding the bike. It is frightening due to her seeing just the shadow. In a short time, she finds the bicycle lying on its own. She comes to Unit 105 to see it partially open. The red ball rolls out of it toward her, and she takes it before stepping inside. When she does, the unit closes on her, shifting to Pete. He wakes up on the couch. After he checks on Tyler sleeping in his room, he goes outside to see Young's car parked on his property. So he checks his security camera to watch the recording of her entering the unit. He rushes there to open it and finds her lying inside, surrounded by blood. The man panics upon flipping her over. How does he deal with this? He wraps her in plastic prior to digging a grave for the doctor. As he washes the blood in the unit, we see man has arrived. He searches for Pete until he finds his son throwing the ball against one of the units repeatedly. Man asks him if his dad is nearby, but the boy doesn't respond. His father finds cracked concrete in the unit and starts to remove the pieces. Soon Tyler tells the guest his dad is cleaning because of the mess he made. Man starts to follow Tyler to Pete. While they walk, Man says a boy named Michael had the bike Tyler rode. The priest asks if Tyler heard of him, making Tyler form a smirk. Pete digs under the concrete with his hands, finding skeletal remains in the process. Then Tyler brings Man to Unit 105. Eerily, he says his dad is in there with Michael. Once Pete finds a human skull, he drops it out of disgust. He also fearfully backs away into a corner. Suddenly, the door quickly slides open, and he sees Tyler standing close to the unit with the priest. With anger, he rushes at man, yet the door slides back down like someone is controlling it. Behind the door, Pete hears man telling him that Tyler is no longer his son. As man tries to perform an ex- Pete attempts to break free from the unit by incessantly slamming into it. He gets many disturbing images during his attempts. Pete hears his son asking him for help. Thanks to his strong will, he manages to open the metal door enough to squeeze himself through partially. Seeing the priest give serious Tyler, Pete uses bolt cutters to cut man's lower leg. Man is forced to repeat that Tyler is not his son anymore, but Pete tells Tyler to run. Instead of running, the possessed boy uses the bolt cutters to steal man's life. The final scene has the police on the property, and they have taken out Young's corpse. Alas, it does not seem like Tyler is being held in suspicion of anything. He watches how his father gets placed in a police car and forms an evil face with a smirk.